all, all roads point to literacy of one kind or another. And that's, I'm going to take you on sort of a journey tonight about digital literacy, how emerging and traditional literacies merge together, and how to involve your kids in learning and literacy development in ways that make a lot of sense to them, but not necessarily to us. Feel free to pull out your iPads and your iPhones. I really mean it. And blog and Twitter and do whatever it is that you want to do. I take it as a personal challenge to be so fascinating that you either don't want to or you can't stop yourself. Either one of those works for me. If you're interested in all the new things that are coming down, the new technologies, new pedagogies in education, so on and so forth, um, I, I strongly recommend that you uh, um, subscribe to the Committed Sardine blog. There are about 10 of us. We go out and we find the stories that we think would be interesting to people like you. We put it together. Of course, all of that is free. The two books that I'll be referring to of mine tonight are Digital Storytelling in the Classroom, which will come out in a second edition uh, on iPad with embedded videos and so on and so forth, and Digital Community, Digital Citizen, which is all about what we call digital citizenship these days, all those concerns we have about things like cyberbullying and kids doing weird things online that we don't know about and really freak us out. If you want to follow up with me on any of this stuff, it's just my name at Gmail, LinkedIn, Twitter, and all that good stuff. If you want to download what you're going to see tonight, you can do it right there. You just go to my web page there, and what's circled there is you just hit that, and it will come down to you as a PDF. As you can see, I own the version of Photoshop with the biceps option. <laughs> so much easier than actually exercising. <laughs> what does the new literacy look like? And I'm here to tell you that it looks somewhat differently than it did to us when we were growing up. And I'm going to show you an example of that. One of my favorite projects I've ever done was I was invited by a Clinkett cultural literacy program to do digital storytelling in a myth-making class that fourth graders were involved in. And so the deal here was that they were studying local tribal values they were to make up an original story that had to end with one of the values as the moral of the story. They were to perform this. They did it in front of a green screen. And if I say green screen, how many people sort of know what I'm talking about? OK, good. And so this is the weather guy um, it's kind of set up, right? If you're, in a, if you're in a TV studio and you're watching the weather announcer, he or she is, is pointing to a blank blue or green screen right there and watching something down here. So this is just green screening. And I assure you, your average three-year-old or, or third grader knows all about this stuff. And so <clears throat> the idea here is that she wrote a song. She, per, uh, she wrote a story. She performed her story. And we had to teach her how to perform. It's amazing. It's amazing. Kids, you put them on stage, especially the ones who act out. You know, Johnny, you're acting out. And you put Johnny on stage, and he just stands there. You say, Johnny, act out. He says, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Act out. Uh, once upon a time, my brains blew up. And he just stands there. Oh, do this. Do this. No, I can't. It's really funny. So we have to actually take him through some kind of process that actually sort of unbinds them somehow and gives them sort of the, the freedom to move and to express himself. And I use all sorts of um, um, exercises to do that. I wish I had a million bucks to study what I'm about to tell you. When I see kids tell stories and move their bodies with their narrative, their writing goes through the roof. When they move their bodies, when they get kinesthetic with their narrative, their writing, their conventional writing goes through the roof. OK, so she is now um, performing in front of this green screen. Then she makes her own artwork. And that goes behind her through the, the miracle of software. And so that's just a crayon drawing on 8 and a half by 11 sheets of paper. And what you're about to see is the end result of all of that. So let's watch Hannah Davis do The Fox. Hey, 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 oh, hey, oh, hey, oh. Oh, 
Once upon a time there was a fox walking around. He was a big mean fox. What made him mean was that he never got anything his way. He would knock on people's doors and be mean to them. He knocked on Turtle's door first. Turtle opened the door. Oh, fox! Fox scared him. Give me your food, Turtle. Turtle did not know what to do, so he grabbed his food and gave it to Fox. Fox grabbed the food and took it home and ate it all. He got full. Then he knocked on Little Bug's door. <coughs> little Bug opened the door and closed it. Fox said, Bug, give me your firewood. It's cold at my house. Bug thought that he would be freezing to death, but he had to give it to him. So he grabbed it and gave it to him. Fox grabbed it and then put it in his firewood and it burned all up. Then his house stayed warm. Then he knocked on Little Duck's door. And Little Duck had a scooter. Fox wanted the scooter, so he asked him, Duck, give me a scooter. Duck did not know what to do, so he grabbed the scooter and gave it to him. Then Fox ran to the lake and got his water and then drank it all. After a while, he saw Turtle. Turtle was hungry and did not have anything to eat. Then he saw a Little Bug who was shivering. Little Bug was cold. And then the last one he saw was Duck. Duck had nowhere to go, so he stayed home. Then he saw a dove flying around. <whistles> dove was flying around, doing nothing. And then he shouted, Dove! Dove looked around but did not see anything, so she kept on flying. <whistles> Dove! shouted Fox again. She looked down and then she saw him, so she came down. What do you need, Fox? said Dove. Fox said, I need you to help me to be a nice person. Dove was a very nice person, so she said she would help him. So they made a deal. Every day they got better and better at it. And <coughs> Turtle had so much food that he did not need it anymore. So he looked in the shelf, opened the cupboard, and found his food and gave it all to Fox. And Fox was happy and put it in his shelf. And then he saw a bug that was cold in his house. He had a million of blankets on him. And then he went to his house and there was a tree by his house. He chopped it down and then gave a whole bunch to Bug and Bug was happy. He broke little pieces of bark off the wood and put it in his fire and he stayed warm. Then he remembered that Duck was home, doing nothing, just sitting on the couch, watching TV. And so he went home, got his scooter, and gave it to Duck. Here you go, Duck. Sorry, I forgot to give it back to you. Then Duck was happy that he ran somewhere to go swimming at the lake. And then... Everyone liked Fox, and Fox was a nice person, so he would be nice to people now. And he learned how to speak with care. The end.
So let's just take a look at the process for this a little bit. It begins with having students draw some kind of story map so they can see their story from beginning to end. This is the story arc. It's right out of Hollywood. If you manage to trap an executive producer in an elevator and give him or her that one minute elevator pitch about the movie that you want $100 million for, because Bruce Willis has to play the lead, that executive producer is going to say to you, what's the arc of your story? What's the arc of your story? So it begins with some kind, and that's only one story map of many that I use. And then there's writing, good old fashioned writing. In the immortal words of George Clooney, that great American philosopher, I'm sure you all know who he is. He was asked one time, so George, what makes a great movie? And he says, you know, I have no idea what makes a great movie, but I'll tell you what I've learned. I can take a bad story and a bad script, uh, I can take a good story and a good script and turn it into a bad movie any day of the week. What I can never do is take a bad story and a bad script and turn it into a good movie. I don't care how much money you give me. Story, 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 writing, rewriting. There's tons of writing and rewriting in this. And then there's performance. So they're actually taught how to perform and then they go back and they rewrite after they perform. They, um, they, they do sort of miniature performances in small groups and we teach them how to critique those and so on. Then she does her artwork and that goes behind her and that's sort of the final product. And then there is the overlay of digital literacy on top of that. Now, I'm going to go to the biceps page, just so it's just jasonoler.com, and you can find this by going down to green screen storytelling if you're curious about this, want to follow up on it. But here's the deal. I was in a school in Nome, an elementary school in Nome, and I did a similar kind of project, and someone ran around behind me with a camera and took so many good photos that I could capture the entire process in pictures rather than a bunch of words. So here we are. This is the team, this is pre-step one, pre-step meeting. I'm not there yet. Plan, permission, paint, you gotta get permissions. You are video recording students and we all know what that, that means. Uh, mom and dad have to sign off on that. I've never had a parent not sign off on that. I've had many hover. I don't know, I don't know, internet, I don't know. I said, well, you know what, if you don't sign that, I, I can't put it on the DVD, I can't put it on the website. That's the law and then they sign, but that's the truth. And so I plan permissions and then we paint that wall so we got a green screen for about 20 bucks. Pre-step number two is the teacher does a unit of instruction. I never come with the content, I never come with the content because then it's like the circus comes to town. I come in with the gear and I come in with the content and I leave and it's bye and you can never really reproduce that. But if I show teachers, if I'm there to support them and what they're already doing, then they can transfer that to the next project. In this case, they were studying local cultural values. Then I show up and I tell a story. Then I map the story. I talked about the arc. Then I teach storytelling. We have a lot of fun with that. Story storming is a particular process I use to sort of draw stories out of them. Then they map their stories. Now the students are telling their stories in small groups. I've, I've taught them how to critique their stories. Now, step seven, step seven, not step one, step seven, they're finally writing their stories. And it is because of all that preparatory work before they write their stories that I think, though I can't prove it, I see it all the time, makes their writing so much better. I can't tell you how many times I have had teachers say, what did you do? What did you do to get my students to write? True story, I walked into a third grade class one time, teacher stops me and says, you know, before you begin this digital storytelling project, I gotta tell you, my kids hate to write. I said, no problem. I walk in, I say, hi kids. I just want to say right off the top, there'll be no writing here. And they went, oh, we love you, be our teacher. <clears throat> <laughs> We're not gonna write, but we are going to story script. That's okay, as long as you're not writing. And they wrote, and they wrote, and they wrote. I call it literacy under the radar. I did not connect this with anything they don't like. I connected it with movies. This is the writing we, we use to make movies. They like movies. Or computer games, they like computer games. So this is the foundation that we build in order to make those things. And then, magically, it suddenly becomes okay. So they write their stories, they tell, retell, peer critique them. Now they're doing their background artwork. They don't have to do artwork. You can grab stuff off the web, you can take photos, whatever you want to do. And in this case, they did artwork and they scanned it. So here we are performing. Okay, students perform in front of the green wall. 
I get them to do everything. And I, <clears throat> my motto is have nothing to do. I try to have nothing to do. I try and sort of stand in the back of the room and I just wait until things blow up and I go over and fix something and, and they blow up all the time. But the idea here is I don't do the direct instruction for every student on the camera. I teach the first one and now he will teach her and so on. And we just sort of get that going, whether it's a scanner or a camera or whatever it is. Then to roll credits by, they actually sang a song, recorded it. They got a little bit of tech uh, help and, and training in terms of how to do the green screen. There you can see an actual example. Here they are performing. Here it is after they've put the artwork behind them. Okay, and then they make DVDs. I was there over Halloween. That was the teacher, Nikki Polk. I think she was a ladybug. And there you have it. And sort of that's that process that I thought you might find interesting. It's what I call the Tao of literacy. I don't think we have distinct literacies anymore. I don't see that very frequently. And I'm saying this as a guy who writes books and writes articles and gets published in some of the most renowned educational technology uh, magazines, but I don't really see distinct literacies so much as I see amalgamations of literacies at this point. So everything that I do with the students, I try to involve what I call the Tao, art, oracy, speaking, speaking, very important, writing, and then digital literacy. And it all comes together in what I call the Tao. Okay. And it all feeds this notion that we have entered a time in education, and I think socially as well, where the question on the table is two lives or one for our kids. Because I'll tell you what I see happening. Our kids go to school and they unplug. And that's quite unnatural to them at this point. They unplug and they live a fairly non-digital life at school. And then the second they're out, they plug back into the matrix. And so do we want to be the generation of educators and leaders who say, you know what? We need to figure this out because we're now living in a BYOD, bring your own device era. And that is only going to get more and more important and more and more salient and saleable because we're just not going to be able to afford every new trend in technology. I am guilty of helping put together bonds in Juneau, Alaska and a number of other places to get schools to buy technology for kids. A lot of which is probably sitting in a landfill. So we had to have these computers. We did. We had to have these computers. We got these computers. Oh, need laptops. Got laptops. Oh, we need iPads. And if we've learned nothing, this is not going to end. And so I'm seeing more and more school districts say, you know what, I give up, uncle, I give up. So kids, you bring your own technology to school and that will become the new starting point. And I would say in probably five years, that's just gonna be so normal, we're not gonna question it the same way we don't question the fact that we take our own phones to work these days. That's a bizarre idea, isn't it? 20 years ago, you didn't take your phone to work? What are you talking about? That was science fiction, right? This is the new science fiction that will become reality quite quickly, in my opinion. And while we're at it, let's brand BYOD, bring your own device, on off. Let's brand it on off right now for our kids. The, hey, kids, the, hey, kids, turn it on because we're going to do this in social studies or math or science, and we need you to go to these websites and do these, these really cool things. And now let's turn them off, and we're going to do something that's going to amaze you. We're going to talk to each other. Let's brand it on off right now. What, now, what are the new building blocks of today's educational experience? Here's sort of how I see it. Number one, we're mobile. It's almost boring to point out until you realize just how new and life-changing that is. Somewhere between five and 15 years ago, it became normal to walk around with your phone. Just an absolutely uh, you know, you know so again, science fiction. Science fiction 20 years ago. We're mobile. We are massively connected. And what that describes for me is a continuum of educational experience on one end of which is because we're so connected to so many good resources that are out there on the web now that you can have an individualized education plan for every student that is tailored so well to his or her needs that, that it is just, it is for that person on the one end. On the other end, you can join any learning community you want, and it can be a learning community of students from six countries studying global warming, whatever it is you want. That's the continuum that being connected provides for us educationally at this point. And the question becomes, where's school? 
If I'm massively connected and I'm mobile, am I, is school everywhere at this point? If we really want to do site-based learning, and I love site-based learning, I think projects, local documentary projects for students and so on are immensely powerful to get some writing and thinking and understanding their own communities and so on. If that's what we're going to do, then where is school at this point and who's teaching whom? Because at this point, we are so saturated with information, it's very easy for a student to become an expert and far exceed his or her teacher in a particular sort of niche area of information in history, science, you name it. That leads to the sort of new reality, and I'm just going to dabble here a little bit and we'll circle back around to more traditional kinds of literacy, but the new the new sort of reality, the new breaking thing right now is immersion. We are walking around and we are literally pierced by so many data signals as we sit here. If I'm in Manhattan, I have probably thousands of people's cell phone calls running through me, TV stations, radio stations, you name it. If we had special glasses, that's what we would see. And guess what? We are going to have special glasses. That's sort of the prototype coming out of Google right now, uh, but they'll come out also as contact lenses. And the idea here is that by virtue of the fact that my glasses know where I am, it will put information up on those glasses to correspond to where I am. And it's called immersive reality or augmented reality. Let's take a quick look at that. Oh man, really? Hey there guy, hey there little guy. Sweet! Remind me to buy tickets for Monsieur Gano tonight. Where's the music section? Oh, yes, this is it. Is Paul here yet? Huh. Hey, dude, how's it going? And I, the possibilities here are just absolutely amazing. I was talking to one teacher in Click One outside of Haynes, and he had the idea to have his students become local experts of their community and put together an AR sort of uh, um, database so that visitors could come put on the glasses and as they walked around Kluk Wan and they come, came up to a house that was historically important, they would get all sorts of information about that. And as they went over here, same thing. Uh, you could actually do it for people if you wanted to. Anyway, there's another way that augmented reality works and let's just take a quick look at that because I have the augmented reality art gallery going on at the Alaska Society for Technology and Education. If there are any teachers here and you see this and you think this is cool, I want to be a part of it, just email me and please become a part of it. Here's the idea. You teach, for example, if I teach my iPad that this right here is a visual signal, I then come up with my iPad, I'm looking at that, and I've trained it to go out to the cloud and bring down information. And let me just show you how that works. So the idea here is that you're going to walk up to a wall, see a nameplate of a student, the name of the artist, and because your iPad recognizes that name, it brings down from the cloud their artwork. Another way to do it is that we hang the artwork, you look at it through your iPad, you're looking at it through the camera, and up comes a video of the artist, him or herself, sort of explaining the piece. The third example, and these are very quick, the third example is you get half of the piece of artwork and down from the cloud comes the rest. So let's just take a look at this. ...of the painting in the student's name. So let's look away, doesn't see it, and then up it comes. So imagine that you walk up to a blank wall and you see the student's name, the artist's name, and the title, in this case the horse, and up that comes. Here's another way. 
let's go over up, but no cause for alarm. We may actually put the artwork up on the wall, and as you walk up to it with your iPad, it recognizes it, and a short video shows up, maybe down in the corner, by the artist, explaining the process that was used, or the class that the student did it for. And here's under like this. Okay. Half of the artwork is there, and half of the artwork isn't there. Anyway. That's sort of one of the new things that's just cresting right now that I thought you might be interested in hearing about. So we're back to the building blocks. So we're mobile, we're connected. We now have a shift from text to what I call the media collage. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on, but that's sort of the, the foundational shift that we're interested in tonight. And then there's the whole digital citizenship thing that I talked a little bit about earlier, and that's that concern with all those issues now of our kids being online, so on and so forth. Let's take a look at text media collage. Here's your new word for today, screezel. Take screen and easel and you put it together and you get a screezel. Here's the new reality. The reality is now we can do something that we couldn't do before. We can erase. If you've ever tried to erase an oil painting, you'll know just how significant this is. But literally, anybody can boot up Photoshop and give it a go at this point and not really pay much of a price for, quote unquote, making a mistake. So this is where our kids go to paint these days. And I'm not saying they shouldn't use conventional tools. They absolutely should. Those should always be around. But this has been added to the kinds of things that they do. And while we're at it, let me give you one more new word for today, creatical thinking. We take critical and creative thinking and we separate them for some reason. And the reality is we need to take critical and creative. We need to put those two things together and that becomes creatical thinking. And so, and so I look forward to the day where we don't separate being creative and being thoughtful. For some reason we do that. Anyway. Screezels are absolutely everywhere. I remind you that if you were walking through the park 20 years ago and you saw her, her on those two screezels right there, you would have phoned the police. Now it's just normal. It's just totally normal. Screezel 3 is the television. Screezel 4 is the big screen. They like what they're seeing so much, they're illegally downloading it. Fortunately, there's a monitoring system that caught them that got beamed over to Big Brother. Apparently those eyeglasses actually exist. He puts out an APB to all his field operatives, one of whom is in an off-track betting parlor, another is in Second Life, and I don't know who that guy is. <laughs> Screezels, they're absolutely everywhere. And the new literacies tend to take place there. And the bottom line is this. Literacy has always meant consuming and producing the media forms of the day. If we have kids who can read but can't write, we consider them half literate. So it is up to us to make sure that students are able to write well whatever they read. What has happened is that we assumed up until oh, 15 years ago that when it came to media, we would never write media. So media literacy meant understanding how those people who had the money and the engineering expertise were trying to persuade us with media. Totally new ball game now. I don't need to tell you. iMovie, it's free. Movie Maker, it's free. It comes packaged with your laptop. Now we can make media. And schools are trying to figure out, okay, okay, what's our role now? What is our role? Because now that we can be literate in terms of not just reading, but also writing media, is that up to us to help kids to write media and to write it well? I would say absolutely yes to that. When my teachers so long ago said your homework is, I assumed it would look like that, black squiggles on a white background. The new foundational literacy is the media collage. What happened to this? This has become more important than ever for reasons I'll explain in just a moment. And it lies behind some of these clicks, but it's no longer the default. So now a good teacher can sit there and say, you know what, I want kids to explore, you name it, gravity. Do I have them make a movie of something that's falling and annotate that with special software that shows their understanding of that? Or do I have them write a paragraph? 
We now have options. You now have this palette. Uh, uh, like artists have palettes of so many different colors. Which one do you want to use? And who knows what's coming next? So we're definitely going to have holography. We're ne definitely going to have augmented reality. And then there's all that stuff that we can't even possibly imagine right now just as we couldn't imagine most of what we have today 20 years ago. 10 Digital Literacy Action Guidelines. We have a shift from tech centrism to new media collage. Here's the surprise. Value writing. Writing is more important than it's ever been. Writing is more important than it's ever been. I have helped kids make over 5,000 pieces of short media. And if I had to put them in two different groups, the not so good and the, and the good, and come up with one criterion that separates those two groups, it's this. The good media was based on good, solid research and writing. Writing, writing, writing. If it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. So now we have a situation in which writing is important as a process and as an end product, but not necessarily the only end product. So when I evaluate student products, I don't just look at the moving image that's on the screen at the end of it. I look at all of the writing. I look at all of the research. And they are much more inclined to be enthusiastic about that kind of writing, I find. And we have new kinds of writing. Visually differentiated text, this is the same information on the right that's on the left right here but it is more visually oriented because we are so overwhelmed we want ways to sort of scan things and see whether that's what we're looking for. And then there is writing for media. And by the way, while we're here, I just want to give a shout out to the people I've been working with in terms of literacy. Those are the three rules. Start young, involve parents, and use resources. And and you have wonderful resources in this territory and I really recommend that you use them and when I said well who's your go-to person this is who they told me is your go-to person so go to that person a uh, digital literacy action guideline number three is art has become a literacy it is the next star there's no question about it. we're in a very visually oriented culture at this point and I don't mean the arts and education as much as I mean art and education I'm all for the arts and education but the reality is, as we go to present things in web pages and digital stories and movies and so on and so forth, we do need that as a literacy. It's beyond, it's just good for the soul, and, it's, and it's, it helps you with other content areas. It is actually a foundational literacy in the digital age. She needs to be able to wield that pencil and be able to use Photoshop. If the SATs had really caught up with the times, there'd be a drawing component by now but they're just not there in my humble opinion. Follow the Tao of Literacy, I talked about that already. Uh, <clears throat> I want to show you an example of what I consider to be a great Tao of Literacy project. And this is digital storytelling. You hear storytelling and people tend to think, oh, that's good for language arts, but that's not good for anything else. I hope to disprove that tonight. This is a wonderful piece right here that involves research, mathematics, so on, and it's got the whole Tao all wrapped up into one. Visualization is right at the heart of my own work too. I teach global health. And I know having the data is not enough. I have to show it in ways people both enjoy and understand. Now, I'm going to try something I've never done before. Animating the data in real space with a bit of technical assistance from the crew. So, here we go. First, an axis for health. Life expectancy, from 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth, income per person, 400, 4,000, and $40,000. So, down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago, in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? 
The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over, Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou. It is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace it's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you have seen in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? And by the way, he has put this on his website, and you can now go mess around with that software yourself. You can feed it statistics. You can get your students to do math sort of visually. If I have a problem with the way that we teach math, it's, it's that math moves if you let it, and we are enamored of movement. But we tend to treat it fairly statically. And, and let me rant a little bit more about how we approach math, seeing as how that's part of literacy. Um, I just, you know, math used to be all about just solving for x. That's what it was basically for when I was growing up. But the reality is that we have whole new kinds of math. And I get kids involved in plotting and showing and graphing their own personal networks. And I show them stuff like that. That's a Facebook network as seen through the eyes of one Facebook person. And it's fascinating, and they love it. And it's a great project that they really, really sort of eat up. And let me also put a plug in for giving a second track of mathematics right now. I don't know what it's like in Canada and US. We're still running off a Sputnik hangover. And it's just, it's, it's outlived its usefulness. We still assume every kid's going to become a scientist. I didn't. Most of my friends didn't. I understand giving everybody the opportunity to become a scientist. The reality is they're not going to become scientists. And what they really need is what I call entrepreneurial math. That's what they really need. If we want them to be entrepreneurs, then we need to give them the math to do that. They encounter math every day. They go to Facebook and they see the results of surveys. Surveys, that's math. Let's talk about surveys and how they really work. 
I work for a research institute, the Fielding Graduate University, and I work with researchers. And there is so much to dissect in those survey results that might actually mean something to them. And why is it that every piece of mathematics beyond basic algebra that I use as a business person, I had to teach myself after I left high school? I don't get that. I just don't get that. Okay, enough for the rant. Okay. Digital Liter Literacy Action Guideline number five is the attitude is the aptitude. We're at a very interesting point in our history right now where there is so much to learn and relearn and unlearn that your attitude towards learning basically determines your intelligence. If you love to learn, you're a smart person, basically. That's a very, very new development. It's like Toffler said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And we need to look at literacy as not just personal, but social. So it begins as personal, absolutely. So we, we become literate on our own. There's no question about that. I remember being tested for literacy. I remember sitting at a table and in comes Dr. So-and-so with a bow tie and he gives me a test. He calls my parents. He says, this is how literate your kid is. They did the same with my IQ and so on. And we definitely start there. But the reality is with all the new media out there that our kids are going out saying, you know what, if you're not going to teach me how to use this stuff, I'll, we'll teach each other how to use this stuff. And I am, I'm going to say something that's so politically incorrect, you're just not going to believe that I'm, that I'm going to say this. But most of the media that kids make isn't very good. And I'm there on the front line helping them make media, and I'm telling you, it's glitzy. They got transitions. They got loud music. They got fun. Do they have good narrative? Rarely. They really need us. They need us to, to compel them, to inspire them, to create narrative prior to turning the computer on. That's exactly what I do when I work with them. They do a lot of story planning and a lot of writing with, and don't really turn the computer on except to use a word processor. In any event, it's become a social act to become literate. And the extent to which we can take advantage of the fact that kids like to write on blogs and wikis and in Facebook and so on, and sort of harness that, because there they are writing, the better. Then we have literacies that are related to the digital impacts of technology and about information quality. And that is very, very, I wish I could spend more time on information quality, how to find good information, what it looks like, where you search, where you don't search, and so on, but we just don't have time to do that. And that goes to the heart and soul of this book right here. In this book, I said, in the last third, I said, imagine an ideal school board. Imagine an ideal school board whose members woke up one day and said, you know what, we didn't grow up with any of this stuff. We don't know what we're doing. So what should we do? Well, I'm dreaming, right? What should we do? What should we do? And I think, by and large, they would say, look, it, here's all we know at this point. We know that it just changes constantly. I mean, last night, a bunch of nerds got together, started a startup, made a piece of software that we all got to have now. I mean, this is sort of normal at this point. So we're left in school districts to basically play whack-a-mole. How many people played whack-a-mole? Which means you've been into a real CD bar. We're playing whack-a-mole with every issue that comes up. Cyberbullying, sexting, and we hit that and another one comes up. And we're going to exhaust ourselves. What we really need is character education for the digital age. And character education used to be normal. It used to be normal to teach character in schools. And then somewhere around the 60s that sort of fell apart and we went into a morals clarification stage rather than sort of agreeing on basic character traits that would be good and so on. It's a very long history that goes on there. But the reality is now that we have kids signing internet use agreements, they're basically signing a piece of paper that says, I'll be a good person, and this is what a good person looks like. And it's sort of odd, really. I mean, I never signed anything to say that I'd be a good person when I went to school, but here we are. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it's, if we're going to do it, let's be deliberate about it. Let's build foundations. Let's have mission statements that look like this. Students will study the personal, social, and environmental impacts of every technology and media application they use in school. Why not? Looks harmless. Let's really get them to study the change that they're living in the midst of. 
I mean, they are so enamored of the technology that it's invisible to them, and there are impacts related to that that I think they're going to grow up and wish they had seen a long time ago. Let me give you an example. There, that microwave, absolutely amazing piece of technology, and without our really realizing it, what it's done is obsolesce the necessity for family dinner. You don't have to have family dinner. There are all sorts of great reasons to have it, socially and personally and interpersonally. I'm not, not saying there aren't. But technologically, because of that machine, you no longer have to have family dinner. When a five-year-old can grab a plastic bag out of the refrigerator and stick it in a machine and hit two buttons and have dinner, you don't need to get together to have dinner anymore. Let me tell you something very interesting. We had the mortgage meltdown in the U.S. One of the only times my, tr my timing in terms of buying a house has been good. And we looked at probably 80 houses. My wife and I were in a, a, a there was so much, the market was flooded. And we noticed a very interesting trend. All the older homes had dining rooms. Remember dining rooms? The newer homes had feeding troughs attached to the kitchen. <laughs> they had family rooms. Family rooms had as their focal point the big screen TV. So that one room in my house growing up that was dedicated to families coming together and talking had been replaced by a room where if you talk, people say, shh, this is watching a movie, right? Very interesting how technology sort of reorganizes our social patterns. In any event, I love to do these kinds of projects with kids. An example here, cyber suitability. So, I was working with seventh graders. I said, you identify an issue about living a digital lifestyle that bothers you, you think we ought to look at. And they said, okay, it's this one right here. Just about every image we look at on the web has been doctored. Do you know that? Over 90%. And we prefer it. We used to be indignant. We can't believe you hauled out Photoshop and changed that photo. Now if you don't do that, it looks sort of crummy. We say, why don't you fix that? It's, it's 180 degrees different. We want the professional massage lie to the sort of uglier truth. So any, in any event, I said, what are you going to do about that? And we used an example, that picture of me. That was the first JPEG to go up on the University of Alaska system before I artificially dyed my hair white to give myself that professorial <laughs> ambiance. And I hauled out version 2.0 of Photoshop and did that. And just and just to be very clear about what I did, doo, 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 okay? I said, what are you going to do about that? And it was their idea to put a number in the lower right-hand corner of every photo you see on the web to give you an indication of the degree to which it's been changed. You click on that and you find out how it's been changed. It's a great idea. It's a fabulous idea. I love engaging them in those kinds of things. The reality is now we are all Googleable. And any kid who applies to a university I won't say any, but a majority at this point. That university admissions committee will go on to Google, will go on to Facebook and look for them. You know what they're looking for? That picture of them at a party face down in a puddle. So they can eliminate them. You know what the remedy to that is? Make sure that we are building positive digital footprints for them. All, all their great writing, all their great media goes on their e-portfolio starting in eighth grade. So that when people go out and they search for them, they see all the really good, cool, articulate stuff they've done. There is no hiding anymore. There is only managing your digital footprint at this point. And I, that is up at that page right there. In any event, here's the real issue here. When do we talk about this stuff? It should be normal to sit down at dinner and say to our kids, so what'd you do on Facebook today? And we don't do that. We need to do that. We need to do that. And I'm not saying you judge them or, or, I mean, use your own approach to however you parent, but that conversation needs to happen. What'd you do on Facebook today? Harness both report and story and embrace story becomes digital action guideline number 10. Now, I showed you Hannah earlier. There she is with that behind her and so on. That is not most of the digital storytelling I do because it's, it's a lot of production. The kind that I typically do with students is voiceover narration. So you're looking at a screen, you're hearing their voice, they have gone out, they've researched, they've written, they've rewritten, they've rewritten, they've got it to the point where they really like it, they record their voice, then they go get images. I was just working with an AP English class in Haines, and Michael Beyer, a great superintendent, said, came to me and said, you know what, my students, they're real smart, I can prove they're smart, I can't really prove they're creative. 
And so what I would like you to do is help them create some kind of digital story about an important event in their life. And I want that to separate them from the rest of the pack. And that goes on their digital footprint. Here's what was so interesting to me, ladies and gentlemen. I was there for a week. I had them for two and a half hours, Monday through Thursday. We showed on Friday to the entire school. It's the only way I'll do it. We've got to have some kind of audience at the end. The first day they spent asking me, what do you want? Just tell me the right answer. Tell me the answer, I'll give you the answer. And I kept saying, there's no answer here, you guys. This isn't no child left behind. That there's not an answer. You guys are creating something that is completely new and about you. And once I finally got them over that line, they produced marvelous stuff. Let me show you one of those. I once had the opportunity to travel to Ecuador with a group of friends to climb mountains. Wow, right? Like really, climb mountains. Elevation 15,000 feet, the summit of Mount Ilaniza Norte. Our journey began languidly. In the hours that followed midnight, each climber was armed with an ice axe, crampons, layers of warm gear, one following the headlamp of another through sideways snow. Step by step, we gained ground, and hour by hour, we moved until scrambling over ice and climbing up the faces of jagged, angry stones became robotic, the mind free to wander as the body endured. There are a few things I thought about as we ascended to the sky. I thought about how tired I was, I thought about how long I had been trudging and how cold my toes were. I thought about how and why in the world I had come on this trip in the first place. How badly I just wanted to be home. How unhappy I was that I was here on this mountain in the middle of a foreign land. Just then, I looked up into the reddening sky. The sun was blushing as it rose to chase the stars away. It was beautiful. I then thought about the city of Quito, Ecuador's capital. How it's dirty, congested, and stuffy, but surprisingly alluring from the top of a brilliant stone cathedral. I thought about beautiful village families walking together in the countryside, and the kindness I found in the eyes of some curious children, eager to smile for my camera. I kept thinking on these little wonders as we climbed on, and through the long morning hours, I began to notice beauty in such small things, the strength of our guides and the patterns of ice, tatting splayed out over ancient earth. As we neared the summit, legs dragging, winds scraping across our faces, I found the paradox. Small, life-changing, and utterly beautiful things exist fleetingly, so you must embrace them on their way by you and hold them close. Writing. You might not see words up on the screen, but you are hearing written words. Writing. That started with writing and rewriting and rewriting. And then they record their voice. And a, an amazing thing happens. I wish I could study this. Students who write, record their writing, and listen to it will rewrite their writing with far more enthusiasm than if I, as a teacher, circle something in red and say, hey, you need to fix that. And they give you that look, don't they? That says, well, why don't you write it? <laughs> they hear it and they don't like it. And they go back and fix it. And with the sort of threat right now that everything's going to be public and on the web, their own internal sense of quality rises far beyond anything I could hope for them to, 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 to sort of muster if it was just, they were just creating it for me, the teacher. And by the way, I do this uh, for health and social services as well. I get clients at mental rehabilitation centers to create digital stories much like this one that's, uh, that um, explore things that bother them. And that then becomes the focus for the therapy that, that they go through. And it's really uh, rather amazing. So, Okay, we're coming into probably the last 10 minutes that I get to talk here. And so what I'm going to do is tell you a very quick story. 
and I'm going to show you how I approach storytelling with students. And this is from my novel, Then What? And it's about the future of technology and learning as seen through the eyes of that young man right there. His name is William Tell. He's the protagonist. At 16, he is the chief information officer for a Fortune 500 company because a talent scout from that company came to his computer science fair to watch all the final projects of all the high school students and watched him, for his final project, break into his principal's Visa card information in public, this is all up on a screen, download it, and then run a character analysis based on his spending habits. You can imagine he didn't really get along with his principal. It wasn't a very favorable analysis. He was about to be hauled off to jail, and this guy from this Fortune 500 company says, don't send him to jail, I'll hire him. And off he goes at 16. It's a novel. It's so much fun when it's a novel. <laughs> you can just do whatever you want. So at 16, he's making six-figure salary, and off he goes. So this is a snippet of the book in which he is in the corporate auditorium, much like I am talking to you, and it is corporate picnic day, and the auditorium is filled with all the moms and dads and kids of the people who work there. And it's his job that day to do the dog and pony show. And the dog and pony show is to show the brand new web page he has been spending months building for this corporation, but he has a problem. He can see it on his screen, but he can't see it up there. All he sees up there is what those of us who speak for a living call the blue screen of death. Nothing. It's just sort of this hum. And he is plugging things in and out. He's, he's testing all the chords. He, he just he can't figure it out. And he's chief information officer. And he is about ready to give up when a little girl comes up to the stage, Jennifer Lewis, 12 years old, pigtails, Coke bottle glasses. She looks right at him and says, Mr. Tail, Mr. Tail, if you hit escape F12 three times, it'll reroute through COM port 2 and come up just fine. It's a Vista thing. <laughs> and he looks down at her, and his first thought is, there's no way I'm going to let a little girl tell me how to fix my computer in public. I'm a little busy right now. Yeah, did you get yesterday's patch? Yeah, well, yesterday's patch had another bug in it, and you had to get this morning's patch and then install that. Did you get that? I'm a little busy right now. Do you even know where the escape key is? Yes, I know where the escape key is. In any event, if I had time, I would go on and on. It's a great story. But what happens is, eventually, he hears a woman in the front row say, well, Madge, no wonder we didn't get a bonus this year with bozos like this driving the bus. And he's looking out into the audience. There's an entire row of adolescent young men with their baseball caps turned sideways. You know those kinds of kids? And they're chanting, loser, loser. Yeah. He has nothing left to lose. And he comes over some psychic line, and he hits escape F12 three times, and up it comes. And he thanks her. And from then on, whenever he needed help with his computer, he went to find a little girl to give him a hand. Now, I tell you that story for two reasons. Number one, if I had shown you a pie graph that proved the kids helping adults with their technical problems was a great strategy to use at a business or at home or in a classroom, you'd forget it. I can call each of you in a couple of weeks and say, remember that story I told? And most of you would be able to go, oh, yeah, about the little girl, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you'd get it. You know, it's the oral tradition. You'd go, yeah, there's an elephant and a no. But, you know, you would have the basics of it would be there. And that is because stories lodge. Stories lodge because the information contained in a story is internally integrated, much more so than a list of information. Karen and Egan, great, great scholar from Simon Fraser University, wrote a book called Teaching and Storytelling. And he says basically what happens is kids begin school four or five years old, really well versed in the story form. They get it from mom and dad sitting around the table, people telling stories. They get it from TV, from movies. And they get to school and we give them information in list-oriented format. And when they're saying, I'm bored or this is too hard, what they're really saying is, where's the story? There's no story. There's no beginning, middle, and end. There's no tension here. There's no transformation here. Where's the story? And I don't care about the information that you're giving me unless I emotionally want to know what's going to happen next. The other reason I'm telling you is this. If he had plugged in the chords and go, oh, it was just a chord problem. Would you have a story? No, you wouldn't have a story. If the little girl had said to him, hey, you know what? Escape F12 three times. And he looked down here and said, great idea. I think I'll try it. Would you have a story? No because you would not have had that right there. 
Every good story has people who change and grow in them, change and grow. And so when I'm doing story development with students, those are the three points that I want to see. And I don't care how they're there, but I need to see some sort of problem that gets resolved and people grow and change in between those two points. And there it is in education, very much the same, except it's inquiry, discovery, and learning. So I'm going to show you a two-minute math movie done by fourth graders. And here's the question to you. What in this movie turns it from a report, a list of bullet points, basically, into a story? How to animate a rolling ball. First, you need an ocean. You need a beach. You also need a beach ball. To animate a ball in 3D, you have to understand your directions. Not north, south, east, and west. For example, left and right is the x-axis. Up and down is y. In and out is z. Right now the ball is at point P on the x-axis. To move the ball from left to right, you have to increase the value of P. Let's add 6 units to the x value of P. Oops, that doesn't work. The ball should roll as it moves. We know that a ball rolls the length of its circumference in one rotation. To calculate the circumference of a sphere, use the formula 2 pi r. We will use the value 3.14 for pi. The radius of our beach ball is 10.24 inches. Doing the math, then the circumference is 64.31 inches. That means we rotate the ball 360 degrees, and at the same time we move the ball 64.3 inches to the right. Voila! The ball rolls. We'll turn that from a report into a story. I'm sort of running out of time, so I'm going to just assume you all saw it. There was a problem. There didn't have to be a problem. They could have said, here's the math of a rolling ball, and showed you, you'd forget it tomorrow. But when that ball skidded across the sand, every one of you in your own way went, well, what are they going to do about that? You are now emotionally involved in the information set. That's how story works. It's fascinating that we're in an age of information overload, and it's story to the rescue, because story is, is the most efficient information container that we have. A couple of things about that process. Uh, traditionally, story idea go to storyboard. I don't use storyboards. If you were in one of my digital storytelling workshops, I would try and talk you out of using storyboards. I use story maps. I showed you the arc earlier. That's uh, another one, the visual portrait of the story, developed by Brett Dillingham, a great storyteller. And there's the story core that's within that. Then after they map it out, they develop a script like you see there and then put it in a story table. So their script is here and in this column they begin to describe the media that they want so they don't shoot from the hip. That's one of the problems when kids make media. They just sort of grab stuff. I don't want them to grab stuff anymore and I want them to just grab words. I want them to choose media deliberately and thoughtfully. And then that's what that looks like and then they actually grab the media and stick it in there. Then they boot up iMovie. I'll tell you, once they're, they're in iMovie land, they're gone. So I have to do, I want to do all this front end work on their narrative before they actually get there. Story advice, we need, this. We need to stop giving an A for anything that moves on the screen. <clears throat> we need to be that generation of adults that looks at a student's piece of media and goes, you know what, I don't get this right here. You're talking about earthquakes and I'm listening to Taylor Swift. I mean, I get stuff like that all the time. 
And you go, well, Taylor cares. You know, well, oh, I know, I know, I know. But it's up to me to drag them over what I call the media maturity line. On this side of the line, they just want to say what they want to say. On that side of the line, they can actually turn around and imagine what an audience member is seeing, somebody who doesn't live in their head. It's a real leap in maturity. <clears throat> okay, a little bit of advice ahead. I'm going to end with a piece of advice, but there's my grandkids. How did that happen? <laughs> what do teachers want from administrators? What I call the CARES system. Compensation, assistance, recognition, extra time, but what they really need is that right there because it's the one thing they can't do on their own. When a teacher comes to you and says, hey, I got a great idea, I want to use wikis and social studies to get my kids to write more and so on, they can't do that unless some administrator will sort of run interference for them. Be one of those administrators. Be an administrator who goes out and finds the really great teachers who want to do really imaginative things with technology and writing and support them. That's the one thing teachers can't do on their own. They can't take a risk on their own if it flies in the face of some kind of policy that's on the books. Turn concerns into goals. Here's what happens. We've all been there. Eight people at a table. I imagine it in education, but it can be in anything. Seven people, there's an idea on the table. We're going to use wikis and social studies and digital storytelling to show about global warming and we're going to connect with people in Iceland and da, 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 this is great. Our kids are going to be so involved. We're going to take science, we're going to English, we're going to pull it all together. And seven out of eight people think it's a great idea and then there's Bob. And if your name's Bob, then there's Ron. And Bob has concerns. We've all heard it, right? One hand goes up and says, I have concerns. And everything screeches to a halt. Well, you don't want to be insensitive. Bob's got concerns. Well, let me tell you, a concern is just a negatively stated goal. Bob, what's your concern? Well, if the kids do all this media, they're not going to do writing, conventional writing. Okay, then we're going to have one more column in the rubric for conventional writing. Bob, we're going to use your rubric. Are you good? We good? I don't know, Bob. Okay, then vote. And it may be seven to one, but at least you don't deny kids the education they deserve. Last thing, cautions. By the way, that's a real street sign. That's in the Catskills in New York. Notice it doesn't say slow down, it says good luck. <laughs> Digital makeup. We're gonna have video conferencing on the go. We're not gonna like it. I love audio conferencing. You know what I do in the audio conference? I sign on. I then put it on mute and I lift weights. <laughs> Every couple of minutes I take the mute off and I say, sounds sort of expensive to me. Thank you, Dr. Oler, you bet. Lift, lift, lift. You can't do that with video conferencing. Here it comes. We're going to have to all look good, so we're going to have digital makeup. Digital makeup, jewelry and makeup. Shaving filters. You're going to make it, be able to make it look like you care. You're going to have canned laughter. You're going to be able to program your computer so that when your boss tells a joke, she hears you go, <laughs> How does it work? Well, that is me after my 40th high school reunion. Little worse for wear, and I had a video conference. I had a beta piece of the software. I thought, you know what, it's now or never. <laughs> and of course, if cost is no object, <laughs> there you go. Whatever you do, please go tell your story. Thank you very much.